Hello there, everyone. Welcome back to TNO, the last years of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. America Lover. But right now, we talk about a visit from Gerrymander. The analysis or analysts had carefully poured over the census data, analyzed the voting records, thoroughly considered the historical trends and socioeconomic factors contributing to local politics. When all was said and done, they got to the drafting. Every inked line, every boundary, every population point was all part of an intricately calculated procedure. When the models had been brought to a reasonable degree of perfection, they were presented to the state legislatures, who signed the new district boundaries into law with many, with nary another word. Only by the next morning did anyone realize the deviousness of what had transpired. The independent analysts recognized the data, the population spread, and voting intentions, and balked at the new voting districts across the South and various other states under the NPP's domain. Each one had been painstakingly constructed to minimize the RD voting share and maximize that of the NPP. Short of an unparalleled seismic shift in American politics, the affected states would be guaranteed NPP five times for at least a decade or two at the very least. Throughout the affected states, the newly disenfranchised voters marched in mass. Many of the marchers were uh, <clears throat> African American, but now they were also joined by a contingent of white Democrat voters who shared their disgust at the blatant manipulation. The marchers were bitter and marred with clashes against those who considered the new order most beneficial, but many of them were able to make their voices heard. Many were local, some were just passing through, some were from the fringes of the old center, now merging into the mainstream to seize a momentum against the darnable elite. In Washington, President Thurman and his chief advisors raised a glass and a cheer to the continued stability of the NPP. The South shall be ours forevermore. Which isn't necessarily bad, even though we want more of the center. And we guess we... Ah, President Strom Thurman. Yes, yes. God said we want the Wyoming-class battleship back. And we also have the Italian Empire wanting to take leadership, but they haven't deployed enough manpower and really don't have enough factories. But okay. Jim... <clears throat> CROW's eulogy as the day of the NPP's first party caucus since the death of President Kennedy approached. Many wondered, some never see some gleefully, what the agenda of the day would be. Most were almost certain that Thurman would speak with regards to the Civil Rights Act. A call to end its reinforcement, at least, if not an outright revoke, was almost a sure point of call expected from the President. And when he took the podium to speak to the assembled politicians, he did indeed open with a talk on the fate of matter. Yet nobody present, present expected what he was about to say. Admitting that he'd been long desired to revoke the act, calling it a sledgehammer to, trying to fix the splinter. Thurman conceded to the concerned forces of the center of the bewildered far right that he would not allow himself to touch President Kennedy's most prestigious achievement. In the interest of party unity, in memory of President Kennedy, and in the name of bringing stability back to America, Thurman vowed that he would leave the act in place. His speech concluded to the relieved applause of the center MPP and the stunned silence by many on the right. After a long day of discussions on the party conduct and rather constructive matters, in which Thurman won many of the far right back, with various promises to push forward with some of their other agendas, the party emerged from the meeting more united than they had been in quite a long time. Though the right and Thurman himself had quietly commiserated over the finality of civil rights, they accepted that a party and nation brought together was far more important than unrepentant reaction. Sometimes we have to admit that the past is the past, and the future is the future, and the present is the present. Mistakes may have been made, may not have been made. Good things may have been done, but maybe not. But that's why we're playing TNO, right? To see what Mott and Bowman's going to do with the reactivation of the Siegfried line. Go, please don't, please don't blow up Martin, please. When TNO 2 comes out, some, well, if it ever does. Uh, we'll see. We will definitely see. we got some comments to go through as well. Let's see, CIA stuff. Oh, the left. Now, technically, NPP, we do like the NPP. The left? Hmm. Huh. Will they vote for us? Technically, they might with Harrington, so let's not suppress them, shall we? Let's not suppress them. Anything there? Uh, I'll close out this one for now. We'll come back and look at this one in a little bit. Um, NPP is willing to put aside their differences for now. We have 72. 72 NPP senators. That is insane. Well, there are only 26 Republicans and Democrats, but rumblings have changed, my friends. Uh, the Klan rallies, as they often do, through the streets of a southern town. The locals are amendable to them, furious as they are being forced to live alongside blacks, and so they march confidently and proudly as they go. Suddenly, they find themselves faced with another crowd. A wash of all races is gathered to stand against the Klan's marchers. Many have come in from out of town in unprecedented level of organized resistance. Soon, violence breaks out between the two sides, and the Klan are forced to retreat. A gaggle of Union representatives sit across from the factory bus. Once outside, or a police would have been quickly dispersing the strikers, uh, or striking workers outside the, like they did at Blair Mountain now. With union leadership, or membership, soaring, the boss sits and quietly sees as he reads their list of demands. He's darned if he lets the strike go on any longer, but fulfilling their demands would ruin him in the long run. The union reps sit and smile, knowing that he has no choice, confident that they finally have the strength to effect real change. There's power in the union once more. Well, hopefully, 
the business stays in shape. But we'll see. The one lone or once lone voices of the left MPP meet with the most radical the center in DC, or just I guess Washington State. The left argues that they've done all they can by playing nice and adhering to the system. America's ready for real change and it's time to push hard and push harder. Because remember, in doubt, when in doubt, push harder and faster. For the first time, the once moderates are amenable to their argument. A decision is made, more funding is allocated to the left, and those within the center are who are tired of getting nowhere agree to help the radicals with whatever they need. The time of mere questioning is over. More and more people are beginning to take direct action against what they perceive as injustice and indignity in the country, and they're beginning to push towards the halls of power. Unless the establishment can offer up a meaningful solution to the problems faced by the American people, they'll continue to turn towards those with fire in their hearts, silent no more. Um, this feels like it's somewhat forced. Because, you know, with Thurman here, he's done his stuff. Like, like th this is an appropriate reaction to, like, with what Thurman's done. But at the same time, we haven't really pushed anything too radical. Like, even Thurman said, we're not going to be doing, like, repealing civil rights and stuff like that, right? So, I, I feel like it's kind of forced into this. But at the same time, I'm not. So, it's just kind of like, eh, I can kind of see it. It makes sense. At the same time, eh, you know. But it, it is what it is, right? Um, so, I guess all is well. Good behavior they have not. The new normal. Ooh, I kind of want to do this one. But we're going to save this one for when I actually do Thurman and do Thurman as a as an actual gamer. We'll put it like that. Fun the Skunk Works. If you like it about Skunk Works, please go right ahead. I've already read it like two or three times, so I don't want to read it again. So, uh, uh, same thing for this one. Uh, actually, no, wait, no, because we're changing. Introspection. President Thurman sat alone in the Oval Office. The papers lay strewn in front of him on the desk. Uh, all the headlines were about him these days, and they came up with so many colorful names. Usurper President, the snake in Kennedy's boot, and even America's Hitler. And although he scoffed at how unimaginative the last one was, he could not help but wonder. Redrawing district boundaries, stuffing the courts, blackmail openly trotting upon the legacy of the man whose death made it all possible. What would history think of him? What would they think of these admittedly blatant un-American actions he had taken since day one to get where he was now? He already caught a glimpse of it. As he glanced out of the window at the masses of protesters beyond the White House fences, they, the thought did momentarily disquiet him, and soon it passed. His heart hardened. His anger flared at those low lives outside, protesting against the authority of the states and the values that America had been founded upon. What did they know? Idealistic simpletons such as themselves were half the reason he had done had to do any of this in the first place, to undo years of government overreach in the name of blind progress. What he was doing was un-American, yes, but he was doing it specifically to save America. No, everything he was doing was good, everything he was doing was righteous, and he would keep doing it until he saw his plans through to the end. This is what America needs, all means are justified in the end of the day. And well, hello there. Inauguration of Michael Harrington. Uh, 700,000, according to the news, helicopters, and National Park Service press releases. That's how many people uh, Michael Harrington is looking at from the Capitol building's east portico. A brittle, freezing wind had been blowing down all the way from the north, cutting through the long coasts and pillbox hats of the assembled dignitaries, but those dignitaries aren't his people. His people are gathered below the stage. There are students from the August Heights of Columbia to America's vast networks of community colleges and state schools. They're activists and organizers, fighting for dignity for justice for a fair shake in the fields of the Central Valley in the streets of Harlem. There are union men and women, proudly paying their dues and giving management the middle finger. They're gathered in front of the Capitol, stretching past the Supreme Court, past the Folger Library, sprawling across the city laid out full of democracy around the world. People watch with hesitancy. In Germania and Tokyo, tyrants whisper about the best ways to subvert him. In capitals across South America, people wonder if the sick, waving Yankees really are finding a new way. Across America, millions watch the spectacle. Some love him, some hate him, but some aren't quite so sure yet, but all are waiting to see what he does. A change is coming to the country, but President-elect Michael Harrington is about to usher it in. At least those 700,000 hope he will. I, Edward Michael Harrington, do solemnly swear I will be up to no good. But, um, Edward, I, uh, Michael Harrington, I don't know much about him. I think he's from Washington, right? I don't know much about him. I like, I've never seen this tree before. This is really cool. The, oh. Picking up the disaster. A bill for undoing the Thurman era gerrymandering shall be introduced. Interesting. Interesting. You lose a lot of pee-pee. The ch chimera in the room, defining normal. Let it go. The corrupt bargain. The dream lives on. Strike a balance. The upcoming civil rights legislation will be str- We're already at- ra We were at radical. We were at radical. We're still at radical. We are dividing America really badly, though. But that's okay. Um, a moral agenda. Pressure the far right. Oh, God. Which way am I going to convince the Republicans? Do the Republicans even exist anymore? They fought. We. Ah. Uh. Honestly, it makes more sense to unite the party. That's the Harrington presidency. 
that he said it couldn't be done. But for the first time in American history, a self-declared socialist, even if some in his party disagree, has been elected to the White House. Michael Edward Harrington Jr., Senator Left Firebrand of the MPP, was raised to the highest office on a platform of workers' rights, progressive legislative reform, and what Harrington described as a fight for the poor, a comprehensive assault on the poverty and lack of institutional support faced by many of America's faceless poor. The latter will involve comprehensive welfare legislation on a scale unseen in American politics, unemployment funds, veteran pensions, and assistance for the handicapped and aged have polled very well with audiences, and will likely be keystones of the Harrington agenda. This root and branch reform is expected to consume the majority of the president's term in office and will face stiff opposition from Harrington's many political enemies, including many from within his own party's conservative and radical right-wing faction, but as Ernest Young, ex-Catholic, knows anything at all, is how to wage a just war. And this war will be the most righteous one of all. We began appointing men and women to win needed to win the war against poverty cool honestly like this portrait's okay like as you saw from the thumbnail it's not bad but it's just like is it is there is it possible to get a, maybe a better one just just saying just asking for a friend just asking for a friend and oh, it's 69 that's not good i'm sorry just what we all know what's going to happen here oh look at, okay so let's, let's let's start up here so this is the diplomatic arena um stuff so doesn't matter down here um yeah center left we can definitely use them no, let's kind of wait then. Cool, nothing here. Yep. And Harrington's popularity. If you want to read about this, please go ahead. Oh. I drew a cup of coffee here to keep us nice and well, though. And, well, warm. Uh, from the economically bourgeoisie to the tortured, exhausted soul of the other America. Cool. The po American populace sounds ready and able to adopt the next set of reforms, as exhaustion is currently seen as non existent. No exhaustion. The bourgeoisie currently likes the reforms of the country. Cool. The influence of the bourgeoisie currently dominate in America. The middle class currently loves the reforms. And then the middle class currently is influential. The working class loves our reforms as well. The bourgeoisie don't, doesn't like it. But the working class is currently disadvantaged. The other America loves our reforms and it's currently irrelevant though. And overall enthusiasm for reforms based on the influence of each class is not great. Michael Harrington, hello. Let's hope he doesn't mess with our economy. He's a democratic socialist. Shake things up. I like the PP. -pee. Let's do that one. What a... Uh, one of Harrington's first goals for his new administration will be simple, to make his presence known. The Beltway is full of those who would deride and oppose his efforts to bring reform to the systems that shelter them. In a coordinated mix of meetings and speeches, Harrington intends to make clear that the lobbyists, cronies, and career politicians took in America. And we show no quarter in this effort to save it. Class privilege, money politics, the wealthy elite. Everything will have to go. There will be no sick of cows left untouched by the pursuits of justice for the American people. In this, Harrington will be met halfway by those loyal to his causes and his party. A slew of proposals regarding radical reforms in judicial terms, health care and pension reform are already being drafted by the left NPP and moderate members, blowing the winds of change all the way to the Capitol Hill, of course. He could also use this as a method of parsing support for his programs and policies within the arty front, for enemies are best kept closer than friends, especially ones who happen to agree with you. But West Russia expects oil, or requests oil. It seems that the Russians are always full of surprises. We had all but counted them out in the struggle against global fascism, but although little news escapes the blood and snow of the war to our north, we have multiple reliable reports of a super warlord that has defeated all opposition. The state, if it can be called that, shares the name and structure of the West Russian revolutionary front of old, but possesses a drastically more militaristic attitude towards the, its enemies and a much harsher one to its own citizens. Whatever the peculiarities of the new Soviet Union are certainly an enemy of the Nazis and thus share crucial interest with the government of the US, it is for this purpose that the CIA has begun a program to send drilling equipment to this nation in order for it to reach resource self-sufficiency and thus be better equipped to fight the Germans in the inevitable confrontation. The now de facto ruler of all of West Russia, Grand Marshal Mikhail Tukhachevsky, appears to be a man of many talents, a brutal man, a uh, brutal man, a brilliant commander, and a born soldier. Whether such things have the makings of a good ally remain to be seen, but he certainly is willing to help with our most important endeavor: the destruction of the Nazi Germany and the unmasking of all its vile works. Our interests are better served elsewhere. Uh, sure, you can have some fuel. Acceptance speech. My fellow Americans, I sit humble to accept the decision of our great country this night, the Bible in which I swear an oath this January behooves me to serve you all as equals. Rich, poor, black, white, country, folk, or urbanite. But looking at the crowd here with me as I speak reminds me that much remains to be done in the task of making an America a place where we all truly are free. I'll be frank, I was not elected as a compromise, nor will I act as if I were bound by the chains which strangled Nixon and the others before him. My position gives power, but also bestows vision. I see the tired young mother struggling at her workplace against the invisible sexism that chokes her career and family. I see the tired old farmer yoked to the agricultural companies that rob him of his due share. I see the fearful young negro walking on the city streets, knowing his every breath is a threat to those that would seek his harm. Their struggle to live, work, and play is my struggle as well, and I'll make sure it is our struggle. For if the other America dies a quiet death just off the TV screen, I, your president, will have failed at leading this one. And the struggle that defines these forgotten ones is not just one of poverty, but of culture, soul, and spirit. Therefore, it would be my task and my privilege to bring true and lasting reform to the system which shackles with crime, unemployment, despair, and low health. 
I implore all Americans to stand with me and with them, my fellow Americans. My party and my country pledge me to protect the Union indivisible. Help me save the Union indivisible, the hungry, tired, poor, those yearning to breathe free, for if we do not lift our lamp besides the golden door we are given, and beckon them in, we do not deserve either. Thank you, good night, and God bless America with liberty and justice for all. And in America of the people, by the people, for the people, of course now, and forevermore. A moral agenda. President Harrington spoke frequently about the need to bring American morality to American politics on the campaign trail, and he tends to follow through with this on on this in his office. His policies will target the weak, vulnerable, and faceless of American society, the other America, and to drum up support from the rest of urban evangelicals and religious rollites. Harrington has emphasized the essential continu continuity of welfareism with the teachings of the Bible and human decency. The aim is to make the hand of the state benign to the American mind, drawing from the social gospel of earlier decades to do so. Of course, this morality will serve as a somewhat less innocent role in the pinpointing potential sources of support for the planned legislative reforms being drawn up by the NPP Center headquarters, and certainly might help in easing some of the more aggressive policies we have planned under the noses of Voters. The American people know better than to look a gift horse in the mouth. And this horse now rides with eagle and cross, bright enough to blind any stray eyes that might wander too near. You know, it's, it's 69, which is very nice, but we gotta go with industry now. Oh, most definitely, because I'm gonna cut this down as much as we possibly can before we have a little bit of a tiny crisis. Finish responding to our actions of our predecessor. The unity... Oh! Oh! Okay, then. Well, then. Six days. We're going to shake things up. We're going to do both of these soon. The greatest disaster. The unexpected presidency of Strom Thurmond was, to say the least, a disaster for the American democracy. The whiplash of the reformist president Kennedy suddenly being replaced by an unelected hardline segregationist shocked the political sphere of the nation to its core. And both sides of the spectrum are now at each other's throats. Worse, Thurmond's highly questionable actions of dubious legality have thrown the integrity of the entire system into question. If we were to prevent the political atmosphere from growing even more volatile, we must work to undo the damage left in his wake. Thurman leaving office it has in itself cooled things down by a fair amount, so we have a window of opportunity to make things right, unfortunately. This can only be achieved by more or less completely undoing his legacy, which will take up considerable time and effort that could have been spent on our own policies, regardless. We must work to address the wound on this American psyche. Lest it fester and grow until the nation burns once more. My apologies. Oh man, that's not good. But the courts. President Thurman was able to use the Supreme Court, an institution designed to prevent tyranny from ever taking root in this country, to his absolute advantage. Through blatant overreach of his power and grossly underhanded tactics, he was able to pack the courts with loyal conservatives who bent the legal system to his will. Though Thurman no longer holds power, the Supreme Court remains in a corrupted state, and even if we fix this injustice, there is nothing to stop it from happening again. We must make sure that Thurman's abuse of legal power can never be repeated. Though most are in agreement that this court should be reformed, there is disagreement as to what this reform should be. Should we simply formalize unspoken rules of the Supreme Court to make them sacrosanct, or should the whole system of selecting judges be reworked from the ground up? Picking up the pieces, it's finally over. The protests. The raucous Senate proceedings and the media a circus that characterized the fleeting Thurman administration. All those in our nation who valued human dignity rejoiced that Thurman ignominiously returned to his old sentencing in disgrace. His presidency is over, except for, the, except for his effects. Strong's gutted the Civil Rights Act so thoroughly that it felt like we're back in 62. Blacks are back at the back of buses. The Southern schools uphold a firm color line. Jim Crow soars over our nation once more, but this time we got to shoot him down for good. It'll be a long, difficult task to undo Thurman's atrocity, but it's got to be done. President Harrington is already drawing up a blue ribbon committee to draft legislative and executive actions to restore civil rights. This included a renewed civil rights act to put some teeth back into desegregation. An executive order is compelling integration in the South. We may have to compromise on some issues to get the legislation through Congress, but we also have opportunities to go further than Bobby ever could have dreamed. With Thurman's game now over, it's time to pick up the pieces, clear the table, and get down to business. I mean, like, I get it. Like, moving is difficult. But if, it, if, if there's a lot of issues here, like... They would. I know some people would already be leaving, like the South, like for African Americans stuff, like Chicago. Uh, I guess technically they don't San Francisco or L.A., but like, and it takes so much money to move. So I kind of get it that like they can't leave. So, a cabinet takes shape. Michael Harrington sat idly in the Oval Office, admiring its smooth, near flawless contour, supported by cozy cream-colored wallpaper and deep blue drapes. He requested that such modifications be made, but it never truly sunk into the office that was his now. With his head so far into the clouds, the president hardly heard the knock at the door that he should have been expecting. Come in, he said, snapping out of his trance. In walked an older, slender man with a deeply grayed, uh, dark hair. Henrington had been expecting Glenn H. Taylor, having called him only a few days ago, and now we finally arrived. Mr. President, he said, sitting down across from Harrington, I understand from your call that you're looking for me as a cabinet member. That's right, Taylor, the president needs a cabinet, and I've dallied for too long on the formation of mine. I want you to be my secretary of state. Taylor looked, taken aback, really? You want me to be your secretary of state? I just don't know. I, I, I was a politician for only a few years back in the 50s, and... Now I'm just a middling activist and businessman, why me? During your tenure as senator, you put up some of the most 
most fierce opposition to the far right that I've ever seen. You're determined, hardworking, and educated. I need people like that in this administration. I need people like you. Taylor sighed, rubbing his chin in contemplation. It's a big responsibility, said, pausing, but a minor to accept. I look forward to working with you, Mr. Secretary. Command power uh, increase goes down, or support goes down. Get more stability, but eh. The general of the war on poverty. President Michael Harrington walked into the surprisingly spacious but somewhat dumpy office of the Marine Newberger. Senator from Oregon, seeing her sitting at her desk on the far side of the room with Harrington closing the door, she stood up. Mr. President, she said warmly, I'm glad you came to me personally. I understand that's how you like to do these sort of things, yes? Would like anything coffee? I got some freshly brewed. He didn't need have... He needn't have said anything about the coffee. Harrington could smell the roasted bitter flavor from just outside the door. Hmm, like what I have right now. He must have made it in anticipation. He, ma he, or she. Uh, I thank you most likely for choosing him. She was on to him. He had never said anything about a cabinet position over the phone. I'd like a cup, yes, he finally said, with sugar but no cream. She obliged him, returning with a delightfully sweet but decidedly dark cup of liquid. It's very clear to me that you know why I'm here, said Harrington. Indeed, she replied. So what position do you want me for, Secretary of the Treasury, ma'am? Uh, Newberger raised an eyebrow. Treasury? Well, I suppose that's what I'd be most qualified for. You're intelligent, respected, and you won't back down in a fight with Wall Street or any other business interests because your yours don't align with theirs. We'll need someone like that for the war on poverty. I think you're quite well suited. Well, she said, I suppose my answer ought to be yes. Uh, the commandment has been chosen. We get more production fixtures to cap and infrastructure construction speed. Well, that's useless. Sorry, it's just we already built all the infrastructure. Chimera in the room. Never has the intra-party unity of an American political movement imploded so spectacularly than it did for the MPP under President Thurman. Where before the segregationists and progressive wings were somewhat willing to compromise with one another in matters unrelated to their main causes. Now the two rant and rail at each other in the halls of power. A chimera nipping at its own head. The future of the MPP is uncertain. The RDs wait on the sidelines, quietly hoping that this will mark the end of their rivals as a major political force. But within the party, there are those who believe this to be the perfect chance for once and for all wrestle control of the MPP for their own ends. Now is the time for powered pa players and of American politics to intervene and determine the fate of this anti establishmentarian monstrosity. Um, anything else here? Jim Crow score. We finally get back down here. Oh, we could do that one, but yeah. Um. Yeah, we, we okay. Yeah, just close out this. I don't want to see that stuff. So, give it to me straight. How badly did you uh, screw up the courts? It's a snafu, President Harrington. Attorney General replied, you stacked the federal judiciary with judges who could fit well into one of Yawkey's rallies. Segregationists, arch conservatives, and the Tenth Amendment's most vitriolic defenders. There'll never be another Brown v. Board with the kind of people put in office. Worst yet, with Scott is stacked the way it is, it's unlikely that any of our civil rights legislation could survive court challenges. The President sunk their head into his hands. Sunk their head. I thought he was a... I thought, was, hmm. What are our options? Well, we got to hit the judicial system first before we get civil rights legislation into the Senate. We could try and play it safe by merely codifying our old judicial processes to further prevent abuse or... Or, Attorney General? Or we just tackle things head on. Gutstrom's uh, judiciary revise the laws for judicial appointments on resignation sec. Close down certain federal courts if we have to. Basically, make it so progressive, uh, get in, in reactions, get out as swiftly as possible. It may take a while for these changes to really change the course, but they'll pave the way for the civil rights to survive any future court challenges. Simple choice, direct your staff to begin drafting legislation that will codify all procedures. While a more restrained approach to judicial reform would have fewer ramifications, it would also likely not make us any new enemies. If passed, it would likely help stabilize the country and boost our nationwide popularity. Revolution as a judiciary. Going for extensive political changes will please progressives and angry, but angry conservatives. Should it pass, will also diminish the influence of segregationist judges and strengthen the future civil rights legislation. We're going to go extreme here. Because we still, we're going to lose senator supports. Like, let's be real, we're going to lose senator supports. The Republicans should probably still go with us. We'll see what happens. But with 58, as long as we keep 45, I'm going to keep, say, 45. That's that's the sweet number I, I usually like to keep. But solidify the line of succession. That Thurman was able to become president all was a result of the most staggeringly implausible sequence of events in American political history. That the president and VP were simultaneously killed while the Speaker of the House conveniently recused himself from taking the position all so the president pro tempore of the Senate could take the title is technically a possibility, but one so utterly unlikely that only the faintest of preparations have been made for it. In order to prevent this political equivalent of a royal flush from happening again, there has to be has been calls for a review of presidential line of succession. Reform of such a crucial element of government process will cost a fair bit of political capital for all Something that has not even had a smaller chance of recurring, but the fact that we are preparing for such an impossibility will placate many progressives who have been left spooked by the Thurman presidency. The party in shambles. The MPP managed to scare re-election out of the chaos of Thurman presidency. It's nothing short of a miraculous miracle. But that does not change the party's current situation. The center views the far right with uncompromising suspicion, while the far right expresses nothing but indignation towards the center's accusations of corruption and malice. The party is at its own throat, and if nothing is done to put the party down one 
one set path. The voters will crucify the MPP at the next election. The president finds himself presented with two paths. This could be the moment to seize the momentum and use the party's discontent to drive out all dissenters, securing the ruling factions control once and for all, at the cost of making the MPP look even more divided. Alternatively, efforts could be made to set aside partisanism and use this moment to be to be better by presenting a united front against mistakes of the past. Whichever option is chosen may wildly alter the MPP's destiny, but there's no other right course. The choice must be made now. Crap. Solidify our control. Using this opportunity would certainly strengthen our wing of the MPP, but may also radicalize some of the opposing wing supporters. Next giving, we must reunite the party. Bro. Like, there's more Democrats than far right, so like, we've got it good for the next two years. General Winter. President Harrington stepped into the office of former Army Lieutenant Colonel William Winter, now turned Lieutenant Governor of Mississippi. It was rare to be a progressive Democrat in the Dixie and Dixie these days, so Winter had caught Harrington's eye quickly. Ah, oh, Mr. President, said Winter, barely looking up from the documents on his desk. I assume this is about a cabinet position. I have no idea how you people continue to figure that out, he replied. I only call and say that I'd like to meet with you. That can't give away much about my intentions, right? Respectfully, sir, a Lieutenant Governor does not typically engage in meetings with the President of the U.S. If you wanted to see me in person, it would be for something important, so what do you want me for? Secretary, uh, uh, Secretary of Defense, without missing a beat, went to reply, of course I accept. I figured that's why you were here, so I had some time to mull it over my head, but tell me, why not someone more experienced? I only reached Lieutenant Colonel. And even then, I never saw much combat. True, but you got that rank for something. Plus, you won Lieutenant Governor as a progressive Democrat in the most southern, hard, conservative state that there is. You're a leader. You inspire people. That's gotta count for something. Secretary Winter takes his post. So how long do we have for this? Oh, we're planning this. Okay, so that's interesting. Our Judicial Reform Act of 69... We don't have all, all the center, which sucks, but you know what? This is very relatively bipartisan, we'll put it like that, because we have more than half the Republicans. We have, I'd say, two-fifths, maybe-ish. Oh, uh, that's almost three-sevenths. Well, almost three-sevenths of Democrats, and just a few of far right. So, I mean, six plus 14, we have 60 senators, so not bad. Defining normal. Actually, how long do we have for this one? I'm not really sure. Uh, we might come back to this one, but we'll see. But defining normal. We've addressed the most glaring offenses of the Thurman presidency, and things are, for the most part, beginning to calm down. There is a hope amongst those in power that can finally begin to return to normal. What normal is, exactly, is a question that still needs to be answered. The 60s have been, without a doubt, a decade of scandal, change, and chaos. President Kennedy championed a new model of civil rights, which Thurman then resoundingly tore up upon the former's tragic assassination, using a number of extremely underhanded tactics. There's still some major decisions to be made regarding both the fate of Thurman himself and the legacy of President Kennedy. Decisions which could radically shift the future of American society and politics forever. A couple comments include from the last video. Why won't Toolbox Theory come out at the time of this recording? Um, yeah, I don't know. The TNO dads are just, I don't know. They're, they're, they're busy doing stuff by the same time. I want it to come out so badly that it's never going to come out. And I'm sure I'm never going to eat those words, right? And someone says, this seems like a good setup for a left-wing MCS run. Yeah, it could be. So, We'll see. The Judicial Reform Act passes. After wrangling both the Senate and the House, we have successfully gotten the Judicial Reform Act through the gears of Congress. This is not proven entirely harmless, however. While the left-wing faction of our parties cheered the passage of this bill, the right has almost universally denounced it. Alongside Southern Democrats, ironically, a bill that was designed to remove partisan politics from one of the main branches of the government has made Washington even polarizing. Or more polarizing. Despite these new divisions, which push forward all the same. Right for a full weapon. Looks better in northern states, looks a little worse in southern states. Our upcoming civil rights legis legislation will be stronger. Chaos on the select com committee. The Senate Select Committee to assess the legacy of the Kennedy and Thurman administrations was bipartisan by design. With the committee seats being given to the far right and center blocks as well as the RDs, the committees were supposed to have or to achieve a consensus on how to heal the national divide in the wake of the tragedy of the Kennedy assassination and the controversy of the Thurman presidency. Instead, the committee's fierce fin fighting stalled any efforts of progress. Today, proceedings were no exception. Right from the get-go. There was an uproar amongst the far-right members when Senator Maureen Newberger motioned to invite Reverend Jesse Jackson to deliver the chaplain's opening benediction. Senator Robert Byrd denounced the motion as political posturing. Senator Newberger then reminded him that he had previously invited segregationist radio preacher Jerry Falwell Sr. to deliver a benediction at an earlier Senate proceeding in that Reverend Jackson better bodies. The ideas of the late President Kennedy, whom his committee honors. This prompted Senator Richard Russell, Richard Russell Jr. to retort that Kennedy's ideals and legislation were precisely the source of all the division in America today. S Senator Scoop Jackson then pointed out that the present committee would not need to be formed had President Thurman not tried to undermine Kennedy's legacy with the segregationist legislation. Senator Burt angrily shouted that Thurman was the only president in the 20th century who fought for America's constitutional rights. Senator Pepper then sarcastically asked if Burt was grateful to Kurt Saxon for giving Thurman the chance to do so. 
Bird and Russell got out of their seats and nearly came to blows with Pepper before the security or Senate security restrained them. At this point, the select committee decided to adjourn early before any benediction could be delivered. God bless America indeed. And it's all politics. Let them kill each other. Because they're going to come kill us anyways, but we're doing the crap bargain. Because we can let it go, but we're not going to let it go. We're going to go to extreme here. There's only one big question about Thurman's presidency that remains unanswered. Why did the Speaker of the House so resolutely refuse a position? The man in question has until now remained quiet on the matter, insisting that he simply could not handle the burdens of power. However, shocking evidence has come to light that suggests a more sinister reason. The Speaker was threatened by Thurman himself so that he could secure the presidency. This combined with Thurman's other acts of dubious legality cannot be allowed to stand. We must launch a full federal investigation of Thurman's activities to uncover any wrongdoings and subversion of the law. And if he is found guilty, he must be punished accordingly. This will make us many enemies among the segregationists, but in the interest of the American dignity. We must remind everyone that nobody, not even a former president, is above the law. The MPP is going to just always lose in the southern states now, but if we can get the ports back, that should be okay for us, right? Uh, I want to read about... We could do this one, but we're not going to. Not yet. Eh, maybe not yet, but we'll see about the abominable maps. Hmm... The dream lives on. Hmm. Abominable maps. Gerrymandering has always been a problem in America. The thought President Thurman took the matter to far more outrageous heights than ever before. No rationale could exist for the voting boundaries created by Thurman during his term other than to gain dozens of extra seats for his ilk with no change in actual voter share. Even many within the NPP agree that this egregious act of subversion cannot be allowed to stand. A bill has been introduced in the Senate that would undo most of the damage done by these insipid map games, restoring the boundaries of the pre-64 arrangement. For any, many pro-Thurman voices, both in and out of Cong Congress or Capitol, are already raising a stink over this thought, though at this point, few senators care for the feelings of this clique. This bill is unlikely to face any real opposition, of course. All right, where is the bill? I'll maybe give it a day. The investigation commences. Um, anything else here yet? No. Now, there are general uh, press conference this afternoon. The United States Attorney General announced that the Department of Justice and the FBI will be holding a formal investigation into the activities of former President Strom Thurmond. In particular, the investigation will focus on allegations of blackmail and corruption in his attempt to secure the presidency, which, with claims that he threatened the former Speaker of the House and if he refusing the position. Thurmond's general conduct during his time in office will also be examined, probing his contacts and his methods to enforce his authority to uncover any crimes and wrongdoing. Public reaction has been largely positive, though the segregation is predictably up in arms. More concerningly, with many within our own party have expressed worry over the implications of this investigation. Thurman still enjoys a lot of support in the South and other pro-segregation counties across the nation. Prosecuting Thurman will enrage them even further and seriously harm or polling prospects in his supporters at states. As the time comes to allocate funding and resources to the investigation, we must think carefully about how strong we want this investigation to be. While many agree that Thurman deserves justice, some party insiders argue that a small, quiet investigation that will likely turn up nothing will be best to avoid rocking the boat and causing yet more disorder, while still placating those who want to see the man investigated. How does insist that we put in enough resources to secure at least some of the charges against him, or even push through to the fullest extent of the law? A decision must be made. Do we play the pragmatist or the side with justice? Keep it quiet and safe? The failure of the investigation, okay? Reasonable investigation? 30 million? Certain of a proper investigation will not run until justice is served. And the dream goes on. President Kennedy was swept into power in the hopes of putting an end to the civil rights crisis. And for a brief period, he succeeded. The Civil Rights Act has brought much need or justice and equality to African Americans and halted the unrest that has spared or spread across the country. All this, only for the tragic death to open the door for the Thurman to come in and rip his work to shreds, reopening the wounds and dividing America even further. If we were to truly move uh, on from the troubled days of the Thurman presidency, we must restore Kennedy's vision after it was so viciously tarnished. Our new civil rights legislation will undo the damage done by Thurman and his clique, reinstating protections and guarantees for racial minorities. This will no doubt infuriate the remaining segregationists, but after the attempted subversion of American democracy, few others are likely to mind us sidelining them. Is there anything else here yet? No. Okay. Okay. Anything here yet? Slaughterhouse 5. Uh, if you want to about this, please go right ahead. I've read that before, so. And so it goes. Can we go any above a radical civil rights? Because we still have it here. So, finalize the language. The time is drawn near where we can finally put an end to the strife of Thurman's reign. First, however, we must... Uh, oh, God, look at that. Uh, draft up the legislation we intend to introduce to undo the damages. Though the so general ethos and aims of our new course on civil rights has been decided, they say that the devil is in the details, and so we must pay close attention to how this bill is structured, particularly if we want to make sure that it can't be undone again at a later date. Clarifying the wording of the bill will make its intentions clear and should help smooth its passage through to the president's desk. The final result might turn out stronger or weaker than anticipated. Depending on the precedent we have set so far, and certain people... Might appreciate or take issue with what comes out of the other end. Regardless, now is the time to put up pen to paper and give form to the new bill that has set us back on the right path. Because a little more unified. Well, I'm not sure how it's going to make us grow more unified, but we're going to say it does. And let's get some more extraction, because we can. We love extracting stuff. Ooh, minus, hey, that's pretty cool. Minus exactly 20 billion. Very cool. 
the New Voting Rights Act. President Thurman sought to end the march uh, to racial equality through subversive and dangerous means today. We resoundingly rebuff this blatant attempt on American democracy and honor the legacy of President Kennedy by bringing in a new civil rights bill to vote. Millions have had their eyes on Washington as we prepare to make the necessary steps to restore racial justice in the country. This bill will revert the damage done by Thurman and restore hope to countless souls who once more felt the sting of persecution at his hands. The segregationists scream bloody murder while the progressives breathe their sigh of relief, but for now we must let their voices fade away as senators sit down and vote. Most pollsters agree that after the dark days of Thurman, this bill will face a few obstacles and it is almost certain to pass, and soon we can finally move forward onto the future of our own. A bill for undoing Thurman's segregationist policies will be introduced. Commence in three weeks' time. Which, we do, we should have enough time to do so. To do that, so. There we go, now we can finally get some more PP. There we go, that's what we like to see, PP. Go, we have 100 days, okay. Um, anything else here? Yep, not really, we have not, not done too many reforms. But yeah, we'll see what happens. New Voting Rights Act. Fair Redistribution and Elections Act Pat. Passes. That was that wasn't quite three weeks, man. I'll be honest. That's a little fast in three weeks, but okay. Today, President Michael Harrington is signing the Fair Redistribution and Elections Act into law after passing Congress under the tidal wave of its popular support. The new law makes it illegal to create a congressional districts that are designed to nullify or suppress the voting rights of minorities, voters of certain political parties, and other identifiable groups across the nation, though it's undoubtedly focused on the recently exposed cases in the Deep South pushed by its former president, Strom Thurmond. Furthermore, some of the most extreme examples in the states like Alabama and Mississippi will have new districts created, overseen by nonpartisan judges, to prevent such flagrant disregard for the spirit of democratic elections. Support for the bill is high across the nation, with groups like the ACLU and NAACP congratulating Congress on rectifying this blatant mockery of American values. The only opposition is in the areas most affected by this law, the southern states. A far-right MPP and segregationists in the Deep South have denounced the law, calling it Yankee tyranny, a vicious, politically motivated attack by opponents. Some have vowed to fight in the Supreme Court, though it's difficult to say if they'll have success. We're getting closer to true equality. The grip of the NPP far-right holds on the South is diminished. Northern progressives applaud this end of injustice. Hey, battleships! Since we're here anyways, let's go do this one. There we go. No more bearing council. Goodbye. Oh, oh, and there goes the WRF. Yeah, the WRF is going to read out fire rush. I want to see Sablon, Sablon win. I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll force him to win, maybe. Or not force him, but I'll just, I don't know, we'll see what happens. Because the WRF is always super strong anyways. They usually win. At least they win a lot, so. Act, hey, that's not too bad. Operational success, thanks for the, uh, thanks for the pee, pee Oh, look at this. So, see, look, I, I knew the Republicans would say yes. I don't know why they don't say yes before, but god dang this. Republicans, but none of the far right supports this, which makes sense. The Democrats are like, yeah, you know what? We like civil rights, and the senators just like, cool, whatever. So we have sixty-five votes. Um, how radical? How, how how radical can we go? Like, we already have affirmative action. Like, is there something bad beyond that? Like, affirmative action plus, but not one stone uh, top another. Annotated, annotated schedule. White House staffer Margaret Brown's notes, 20-03-69, POTUS discussion. War on poverty to be this administration's main stance, outlining of potential opponents of progressive welfare policy and administration. Senate and House, note POTUS requests. Directs or reports to be made by 0800 hours Friday. Liaison with trusted party members of the party left. Notable members of Rep Dem Party and opposition, Wallace, Spiro, etc. Meeting with staffers, POTUS stressed need for unity and resilience in the face of possible in-party opposition. Called her own Dixie clique and reactionary wing snakes in the darn grass and redacted for sense of content. Ask for those with a heart for the working man to join party center grassroots movements and organize. Note, how do we move to organizing our own rallies without the party right knowing? We'll check the grassroots organizers this month. Meeting with Senate, POTUS declared a new mooring in America, gave speech on the modern-day slavery of entrenched interests, and declared intention to destroy the political chicanery holding this country back, much booing for the expected opponents. Wrap them in our own conservatives. Profiles of notable opponents attached for later use. Party left gave expected levels of support, although news from the Vine suggests some caution to the radicals. Note. Explore direct down collaboration, Johnson option, possible alignment with our goals. Final notes, we're meeting more resistance than expected, but we always knew how attached this establishment would be to the thrones. I don't care what the Dixies or the Rep Dems call us or President Harrington. We're taking the country back, and anyone who isn't with us, well, they're a trash can waiting in the uh, history books. It's time everyone knew the, the new king of the hill. This cannot go wrong. Totally cannot. Convince the Republicans. Pressure the far right? Um, hmm. Promise them stuff? Unite the party? At this point, we've already said, screw it, we're going to convince the Republicans. The progressive wing of the RDs might have broken ranks with Harrington Circle and party allegiances, but the hearts are in the right place. In fact, they might prove more reliable allies in pushing Harrington's policies in the principled opposition to the party. And the legitimacy of having members of the old Beltway machine stand with us will do so much more to promote us to skeptical Americans. It simply wouldn't do to neglect of such a valuable source of political capital. And nothing gets the American people cheering faster than a rare display of cross-aisle unity. 
Meeting between LBJ, Congressman Rusk, and Harrington's staff will begin this process of reconciliation. The party riots are likely to be inflamed by the selling out of the establishment, and no one knows how far party unity can be pushed, but reform comes at a cost. And the progressive movement can't afford to sacrifice its ideals on the altar of political expediency, which makes sense. It does make sense for us why we should go down that path. But for now, um, I'm done pushing PP for now. I think we'll be okay. We should be okay for the future. The sum of all fears. Uh, so ordered? Uh, if you wonder about this, please go right ahead, so. You know, just in case. I'm going to save anyways. Yeah, I mean, it does make sense for us to go, go with the Republicans. There's only five senators. But we'll see what happens. We'll definitely see what happens. As we're going to try to cut down the debt as much as possible before we just balloon the deficit to an extreme amount. Or comparatively extreme amount, so. Moral minority. Uh, the German center flotilla. We can take the take a pass. Nope. Tell the Germans to back off. Moral minority. From the memoirs of Edward Michael Harrington Jr., it had come to me, in my scattered thoughts in that busy newspaper hall in New York all those years ago, that my God was quiescence and quiescence, if not outright non-existent, but my faith in the essence of such worth, the dignity and pride of man, that which is granted to each of us at birth, and which cannot, the world cannot rest away save through death. That faith could no more leave me than I could choose to leave my bones and skin. Hence, I pursued a singular goal once more in office, most peculiar to my peers and aggravating to my opponents, the return to an honest American morality and police policy making, away from the gilded shame it had become in the hands of capital. I began my third speech to Congress with a story, and my, any child will tell you, and proudly that, if, uh, if one were to see a starving beggar at the side of the road, the right Christ-like American thing to do would be help him up, bring him home, and treat his wounds. Indeed, if the ch child were to recommend that we leave him at the roadside to live or die, any parent would rebuke him. The desire to protect the common well, uh, common wheel is ingrained into the nature of man itself, yet because of our country's business halls and public offices deems poverty a sin and helplessness an untreatable illness, we've all become hypocrites. We rob the beggar of his right to health care and safety, the mental patient of his right to equal and proper treatment, and the criminal of his right to redemption and restoration of the world. My question, friends, is this. When your children grow old enough to see you as an equal, know your accomplishments for what they are, will they call you a hypocrite too? Someone who knew his duty to his fellow man, but spurned because he was weak, afraid, or simply had too much to lose? And that terrible tide of hypocrite, will you deserve it? We must love our neighbors as ourselves, no matter the cost. Which is it's, 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 it's interesting. So, like, we, are mental still, institutions still open in, do you know? I, I'd imagine they are, but, like... Huh. Interesting. But you know the progressives. Lens flashes, handshakes, wide smiles of the cameras of the nation's presses, in a series of well-publicized and widely lauded meetings. Harrington and the moderates have united with, the, with LBJ and his fellow Rep Dems. Uh, Rep Dem progressives in a common front to the promote vital and far-reaching reforms in American politics. The fact that neither side agrees on precisely what those reforms will entail only adds to mystique surrounding the sudden bipartisan shift. If you wonder about the, uh, the Germans' fault, please go ahead. The next logical step would be to make uh, what is already obvious public knowledge. By consolidating the support of what some are describing as a newer dealers, Harrington Circle will be able to force a confrontation with conservatives and the MPP, but on his terms. Bipartisan support will prove a powerful, intimidating factor for diehard opponents in the party riot, and it might convince them to reach some form of consensus with the administration at large. A home for heroes. Washington wasn't all that different from academia or the lecture circuit President Harrington, th President Harrington was discovering. Congress didn't lack for opinionated men and their pet theories and projects, even if Harrington thought they were clearly misguided. Mr. President, even if everyone's here on board with their program, we're going to have to convince the people that we're on their side. Vice President uh, Irving Howe said, We get the people supportive of our reforms, the less opposition the RDs will be able to put up. Harrington nodded. It wasn't rocket science. He promised America presidency of the common man, and he wouldn't, and he would keep his promises. The only question was where to start. What about the veterans? Sec Defense Secretary William Winter said, Uh... America has thousands of men who serve in South Africa and the Pacific. No one's going to object to us treating our heroes right. A home for heroes. Nobody would question the need to repay America's soldiers for the service. The far right of the FN, the MPP, would be ecstatic, and the RDs would be hard-pressed to say no. And if the veterans got a fair deal from the government, then the people might come around and be to being included eventually. A grateful country awards soldiers. New decisions for designing the program have been unlocked. Sure can pass expediently. We only have 60 days to draft the bill. Crap. A foregone conclusion. Michael Harrington sat at the head of the long meeting table, exquisitely mahogany carved, and... Uh, must have been a little over Baker dozen of politicians he all knew by name. McGovern, Dole, Rumsfeld, McNamara, Gore, Rockefeller, Ford, and several others. So, gentlemen, Harrington began. I brought you all here today because I believe we share common interests, and many work together for these interests. I am officially asking for the support of the RD party going forward. Our administration needs more support to pass its legislation through Congress, and I am of the belief that an agreement between our two parties may be reached. So, what do you want us to do? replied George McGovern. I'll be willing, but I won't blindly just follow you. 
Think of it more as a bipartisan agreement for the common good, said Harrington. Absolutely not, interjected McNamara. You think a party would rally behind you? When I tell this to the Democrats in Congress, it won't be pretty. Dole's next to speak. Hey, now, let's not be too hasty, yes. The president here might have a few good radical ideas, but we could get some serious legislation with passed with this alliance. Several members of approval went up around the Republican side of the table, but the few Democrats remained silent until Donald Rumsfeld stood up. Listen to yourselves. You'd rather break up the party for some progressive pipe dream than focus on what really matters? I won't add any more fuel to this fire. Goodbye. With that, he stood and walked out of the room, followed by McNamara and an inconsequential number senator, whom Harrington couldn't remember the name of. Let him go, said Bob Dole. They'll come around sometime or later. Mr. President, I'm all for this alliance. Despite your more radical policies, I have great respect for you and your de dedication to the well-being of America. However, I'm also sure my compatriots have such convictions. Please give us a few minutes to discuss this. Harrington ob obligingly left the room, checking his watch every minute or so. Two minutes, four minutes, seven minutes, nine. It went on and on until suddenly the conference room door gently opened with an entourage of Republicans filing out. Bob Dole stopped and looked at the president, nodding gently. A victory for the progressivism. Yeah, they grow more divided just like us. Yay. So what was this one about? Um, oh. So now I can... Ooh, look at that. Adding this provision will ensure that the program has a greater impact on education. That's kind of cool. Uh, job training on industrial expertise. Secure funding for the middle class. The... R wait. Secure... F oh, secure funding from them, not for them. Taxes on the rich. 15, huh? Finalize the program. I mean, we're going to blow the living crap out of the budget, so... I don't want to do this stuff. I mean, our, I mean, our deficit is... It's really not bad. So... Uh, the Diplomatic Arena. Um, I kind of doubt this one is here yet, so... Let's take a quick look here. Nope. Can we get increase uh, unity? We'll only put aside the differences. Somewhat united. That's not bad. Diplomatic Arena. Yeah, we don't really care about that. Um, yeah. Polarized. In recent weeks, several of the far right wing of the NPP have officially walked across the aisle and joined the Democratic Party. In addition, the Democrats have decidedly grown closer to the far right in response. It appears that this sudden extreme action is in response to a conference held between the leaders of the RD Party and the Harrington administration, in which Republicans and President agreed to work together. The few uh, D's invited to the meeting, including Robert McNamara and Donald Rumsfeld, quickly left after they claimed the President was not interested in making compromises. This new alliance between the Republicans and Progressives is already visible in Congress, with the two groups voting almost unanimously on the legislative proposals. A fiery speech given by Strom Thurmond in the most recent Senate vote just showed how far the MPP has split over this issue, with Thurmond calling the President a traitor to the party. Despite the large political shakeup and the new counter alliance seemingly between the far right and the Democrats, it appears that most poor and middle class Americans are warming up to the Harrington administration. The same hour cannot be said for the wealthy employers. Those who send millions from the presidential social programs. Geomagnetic reversal. Between the White House and the rich will decrease. Well, not much I can really do on that. Bring it into the open. We've secured the support in the Senate and the Congress. We need to bring the fight for the poor of the American legislative bodies. But as with all revolutions, we must bring this fight of the common man to assure its success. Harrington plans to announce his plans for comprehensive legislative warfare on the steps of the Capitol in a speech that will be open to the American public and, or people, and broadcast on all major news networks. The popular support we will gather will be critical to mustering support against a conservative establishment hotly opposed to big government intervention, sweeping aside any of our own party with personal reservations on the program. And also acted as a decision point for many of the political figures who have remained indecisive in their support for the programs. But forcing them to take a stance for or fight against the fight will bring their real sympathies and prejudices into the light of day. Our own advisors suggest that this will work to our advantage. It will be considerably more difficult to predict how this will affect an already polarized political atmosphere, but given our prior efforts to secure support on the Hill, we're likely to carry the day. Nice. Increase by 75 million? That's 75 million? That's nothing. That's nothing, man. That's nothing. Spend, my boys. Spend. That's not bad. Yemen is killing itself, but hey. Meet with actors. Oh. Cross the country. Going to the special increase the Senate support for our future bills. Cross the country. Ensure the American people remain more committed to pursuing our plan reforms. Urban poor. Rural poor. So open their hearts. Open their minds. The better angels of our nature. White House and everyone will improve. Working with unions. Meeting with senators. Working with grassroots. Talk with Chavez. Um, you get political power here, too. Pre middle class. Uh, other America. Ooh. American people remain more committed. So, Senate support. We don't need more Senate support. So, um, I kind of want to go across the country first, maybe. Because we have enough Senate... Probably. I don't say we will, but we probably have... Oh, we have 58 Senator NPP Senators. So, I mean, if you want to read about these, please go ahead. I think it just makes more sense. Um... 
to go down with the right side. Talk with Chavez. I mean, that's not just meeting with activists, but, like, we gotta go to the people, man. So, there you go. As much as I want that extra PP, I think this would be better. Cross the country. The forces are ranged against us in the halls of power. Formidable. And rumors are spreading that the MPP Senator Harrington Leeds is destined to be an incapable sitting duck. To counteract these rumors, the administration has a plan. Go around and bypass the establishment in its entirety. All the bloated mess of bureaucracy and money politics the president was elected to destroy. Our first step will to reconnect the office of the presidency with its old humility. Harrington will be a man for the people, other people, by the people. We're drawing up plans for a cross-country tour where Harrington and his deputies will meet the peoples personally without the encumbrances of career, position, or social status. People might demand we stop this foolish domestic ploy and return to serious policy, but they simply don't know what America needs is a good dose of honest leadership. And um, Harrington will give it to them. Royalist victory in Yemen, okay. Uh, oh, if you want to read about that, please go ahead. Thank God they caught him. The Stonewall boss, if you read about that again, please go ahead. Uh, last voyage of the USS, uh, United States. If you want to read about that, please go ahead too. And if you're we shall overcome. If you want to read about that, please go ahead. Not another one. Cool. And thing, adding fire to the fuel. Oh, look at this. Oh, crap. Oh, wait. To ensure the program smooth, proceeds smoothly, it can only contain a total of three provisions. Oh. Here out other America. The working class is currently disadvantaged. They love our reforms. They, they like our reforms. Criminally dominant. Middle class. Help the bourgeoisie out. Well, we're going to need a lot of PP, so I don't want to do this, but we're going to do this anyways. That's 100 billion is not bad. Um, influence of the rich will be decreased. Well, we want the middle class and working class up, right? So, help them out. Influence will be increased. Influence of the rich. Now, if we do something here, will that affect what we can pass later on? The White House and middle class. They love our forms. They're influential. We want the working class to be really higher. Reassure the working class. We're already pretty good with them at 100. Let's increase their influence at 75. Here out other America would be pretty, pretty good as well, but they love our reforms already, so... We'll do that one. And help them out. Let's decrease their influence as well. That's expensive. Let's do that. Yeah, let's see what happens. So, what is that now? 37, 69, still 80. No, they didn't change too much yet, so we'll see. Kick lines and two gas. We're going to about that. Let's go ahead. Cool. The urban poor. America's cities hold a growing underclass of disaffected blue and pink colors, many of them people of color and refugees from the pact and the sphere. The ravages of the 50s and the collapse of the trade with Europe and Asia only served to hurt this underclass and triggered their political radicalization. Harrington has not forgotten their political support and tends to solidify it by signing off on large-scale projects in lower-income districts, speaking to communities, and providing large monetary stimuli to a few select a determinant on probable political effect. Harrington and his aides also aim to continue the moral pivot by appealing to employers in the major cities to provide job pensions, health care benefits, and so forth to the lower income constituents, and encouraging unionization as a step forward equality with well-educated counterparts. Our anti-corporate stance will not only just earn us the trust of union movement, but also act as a reassuring gesture to the Social Democrats in our own wing of the party. It also earns the ire of the pro-business party right, but it isn't going to be the be the establishment that turns America around. Um, if you want to about this, please go right ahead. How will the Germans respond? I think at this point we don't really need too many more divisions, but we're gonna keep keep one for now. So the decline hotline. Um, we're gonna build that. Please go ahead. Minor setback. Uh, let's get let's let's let let's let it succeed. I don't want to stall yet, so it succeeds. Okay. Cool. That's not bad actually. I don't think I've read this one before, but maybe I have. The President of the U.S. gently gripped the Fuhrer's hand and shook it, thinking of all the men who had died in South Africa, with this agreement, hopefully. Such a thing would never happen again. The OFN was safe from a further attack, at least from the East. The Japanese in the West began to mobilize against them. Meanwhile, the Emperor would be facing the might of two superpowers, not just one. The free world may very well have been saved in this very room. Jack Kennedy had been lauded across the nation for solving the Hawaiian Missile Crisis, true, but... What would the American public think of the Commander-in-Chief that had stopped the Britain Missile Crisis before it even happened? It had certainly been an eventful day, that was for sure. As the American delegation was escorted by the conference hall by the Secret Service, however, the President happened to lock eyes with Bormann, sitting across, uh, sitting amongst his fellow Nazis, who were babbling excitedly in German. The weight of what the President had done finally hit. America had, for the first time ever, struck a deal with the crowds. A fascist power, brutal and cold in its repression of its all dissent, and the world's beacon of freedom had shown itself willing to compromise with them. Suddenly, what had thought what happened to the boys in South Africa was no longer a reassuring thought. Nonetheless, the President shook themselves with dread, placed their doubts aside, and stepped through the conference hall doors. Immediately, a gaggle of reporters swarmed the group, flashing cameras and asking questions. A single reporter's voice was heard above the rest, asking the president what had occurred behind those closed doors. The president took a deep breath and answered, We made history. Not bad. Um, 
Are you sure the working class? Yeah, we can't do anything here yet. So, Harrington's people tour. After we click on this stuff. President Harrington has become increasingly tired with the inflexibility of the Senate. <laughs> Passing his reforms to Congress turned out to be a very difficult task. Really? Encountering the inflexibility of the conservatives and even the moderates. So he decided that instead of dealing with the increasingly hostile Congress, he would go back to his roots. A tour across the country would be organized to talk with the, to the common people and listen to their problems. This would allow uh, to create popular support for the progressive agenda and prove his image among those communities more hostile to him. The reactions of the so-called People's Path were mixed. Progressives, the plot of the president's decision of staying true to his ideals of being the people's president, and they hope that this tour can gain sympathy for the progressive cause. Some moderate, sympathetic to Harrington's program voiced a concern about the project, arguing that the president should stay in Washington to focus on passing his reforms and deal with other problems. Non-progressives were more critical about it, defining the entire thing as nothing but a vanity project. Some conservatives went so far as to call the tour to attempt to create a socialist personality cult. Harrington ignored the critiques and focused on organizing his ambitious tour after all. These people bothered to put him in the White House. Why not return the favor? Let's just listen to what the people have to say. Open their minds. The city schooling in the poorer districts of American cities have always been troubled. Lack of funding, high crime rates, poor sanitation, exhausted teachers have essentially crippled these inner city schools. By emphasizing the roles of proper schooling and aiding tours of schools around the country to Harrington's schedule, we're going to endure ourselves to the urban poor, especially if we couple this with a mix of token moves hinting at a broader structural reform of the education system. We can perform such perfunctory moves as increasing the education budget slightly, making encouraging speeches to the teachers' unions, and encouraging congressmen to take individual action to better education in their states. Whether we follow this up with said reforms is up to the administration at large, but a sizable minority of the Senate are against further strains on an already ballooning legislative agenda. And our political capital grows more fragile by the day. We must choose wisely, lest we end up forsaking the forest for the trees. This is a surely not the last time we'll encounter such a dilemma. The Veterans Service Act goes to Congress. It's good. Send it through. Harrington looked up from his dog eared or dog eared copy of the proposed Veterans Service Act, giving his affirmation of the latest draft. Approval in hand, his army of aides scattered out of the Oval Office to carry the draft to Henry Jackson in the Senate and to other key lawmakers in Washington. Outside the White House, the night grew darker as the clock chimed midnight. Harrington rubbed his eyes, dropped the strain of reading through the draft. He took a close eye at every line, the first act, the one upon which everything else would follow. It would be perfect. Senator Jackson was sure that the rest of the draft would go through Congress to take care of the rest. It ought to be easy, Harrington thought. Everyone loved veterans, and the MPP could finally stick it to the RDs, not only for being soft on the fascists, but ungrateful to the soldiers. Education subsidies for veterans increased access to health care, disability payments for the injured, and who in the right mind could oppose this? Harrington sighed, it had been an exhausting night regardless, and it would only get harder from here. One day, one bill at a time. Are they actually reading bills? Do they do that in Congress? That's not bad. We have, how many guys here? 20? So, 70, 78. 83 senators are supporting this. Not bad. That's actually pretty good. Um, I keep... Uh, this one, I'm pretty sure won't happen, but let's see. Yeah, we can't increase... Uh, it's constantly bickering. Can't increase the MPV for now, but Harrington addresses the poor. President Harrington made a stop at one of the many charity centers of the New York City to address the poor and helpless. Harrington felt confident in his ability to speak to the poor. All those years of activism on his youth weren't in vain. Look, fellas, I'm not here to make a campaign or anything like that. There are no journalists, no photographers, and not even bodyguards. Harrington wasn't entirely honest with that one. There were two members of the Secret Service infiltrated behind inside the crowd to avoid any lunatic from doing something funny. I'm not going to tell you vote for me or any of that political crap. You tell me your names, and I'm going to sit on this chair and just listen to what you have to say. At the exact moment that Harrington sat on the chair, a hundred hands raised up in the entire room filled with voices of dozens of people. One time, at a, one, one at a time, please, requested Harrington. A crippled man with a long beard went first. I'm Jack. I lost a leg fighting the Nazis in Wales. They rewarded me by screwing my effing pension. I've been homeless for ten years. Another woman with small children on her lap was next. I'm Brenda. My landlord expelled me from my kids from my house. I don't know what to do. Then a young black man, I'm Terry. I'm a drug addict in recovery. People refuse to hire me and call me names on the street. I feel like I can't change anything. Every single one of the 70 souls inside the room started to tell their stories for the next two hours. Harrington was out for words at first, but he finally got up from the chair to deliver an answer. This is outrageous. How can people suffer like this in the richest country on earth? I'm going to do everything I can to solve this, and I'll resign in shame if I can't change anything. The entire room cheered at him as Harrington thanked the people for support. Local newspapers tracked the people in the meetings weeks later, reporting that their situations had improved a lot since then. President Harrington's approval ratings went through the roof in New York, with a similar result in other bigger centers. The poor won't be left alone ever again. Popularity in urban states will increase. The rural poor. The Dust Bowl and Depression dealt a crippling blow to American life outside the city, and the rural population has never really recovered from its ravages. Political sidelining deteriorating living conditions once again turned the Midwest radical with an anti-urban sentiment as incent incomes and plummet as incomes plummet and jobs leave never to return. Growing fundamentalist sentiment as in speeding state legislation and worries over the security of what little economic opportunity remains. President Harrington has a plan, however. He will seduce the troubled hills and valleys of America with a vision of equality. When will the jobs come marching back in and the city folk learn to respect their rural brothers as equals? More pragmatically, he will promise increased spending on education and infrastructure for America's rural stragglers, and even expansion of farming subsidies to ease the burdens of America's breadbasket. None of these problems will come free, and some might not even be achievable, but it's a beautiful dream, and eh, dreams are the only thing in America more real than life itself. 
Cool. Any civvies yet? No? Okay. Can we cut down debt? No, please. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going until we have blown it up. Considering reports. Um, if you want to read about this one, please go ahead. Nice. Actually, did this change at 69? 78? 75, I mean. 75. Why did I say 78? 75 is not bad. Working class is 40. Not bad. Not bad. Bring up the working class. Yeah. Give them more influence for now. That'd be good. And reduce the influence of the bourgeoisie. Good. That's going to cost so much, PB man. Here out the other Americas are not bad, but they really love our forms, right? Yeah. So. Uh, Harrington addresses the middle class. After leaving the big urban centers behind, Harrington wanted to address the middle classes to further push his progressive agenda. This stop, in particular, was particularly calm. Our, uh, a community in Florida filled with conservative middle-aged people, a place where Harrington was really unpopular. The speech was nothing special with Harrington talking about the importance of helping fellow citizens, especially the poor. Some voices of disapproval could be heard when Harrington talked about the importance of everyone doing their part to end poverty, as is interpreted as an attempt to raise taxes. The interesting part came when Harrington didn't announce that he would be taking questions from the crowd. His aides warned him that it was a risky strategy. The discussion gets heated. The right-wing press was going to eat him alive. Fortunately, Harrington was ready for that. The questions were mostly conservative talking points that had already been heard a million times, so he had no problem answering them. However, the mo moment that most resonated with the events was the exchange and the president had one with, with one person in particular. An elderly man wearing a, a cross-shaped necklace asked, Why should I give my hard-working money to lazy people that don't contribute anything to society, Mr. President? Harrington decided to make a gamble with his response. I've noticed that you're a Christian, isn't it? The man nodded proudly. Well, uh, while I admit I'm not a big religious person myself, I'm a bit familiar with Jesus' teachings. Didn't Jesus talk about the necessity of having compassion and pity for the poor? And knowing what he did with the merchants of the temple, I don't think he was very fond of the invisible hand of the free market. Harrington exclaimed. The reaction was mixed, with some outright booing the president, but others laughing a bit. Conservative newspapers fiercely criticized the president for using Jesus to push his her heretic communist agenda, but the liberal media celebrated Harrington's witty comments on religion. The president is sure he made a good impression. Jesus supports progressivism, how about that? But there's always a, isn't there always the argument that, like, not forced redistribution, but, like, charity? Hmm? It is what it is. Rural poor, though. That's on the screen. If you want to about that, please go right ahead. And just in case, let's save. Just, you know, just in case Japan wants to go kaboom with us. Game it through to Washington, there's an entire Japanese fleet on the way. Soften their hearts. Now that we've begun to over gestures to woo the rural underclass of America, we gotta demonstrate our commitment. How can we persuade the rural poor that we mean business and we won't just abandon them when it becomes politically convenient? President Harrington and his aides have a plan, being <clears throat> no strangers to romance themselves. Any good seduction must be followed with a dramatic gesture to prove one's love, preferably in public, and with fireworks in the background. For the dramatic gesture, we'll announce a pivot to the heartlands, where in domestic relief for the struggling un unemployed outside the cities will be expanded and rudimentary social security introduced. States will be pressured to adhere to this legislation and punished with condemnation on the floor of Congress if they do not. We'll make this conversation public by encouraging news agencies to focus on the rural poor and on our domestic reforms, ideally painting us as moral urbanites coming to uplift the rural brothers of their rightful place. And for, as for the fireworks, well, with all that's been going on, the reaction from Congress will be sufficient. Harrington addresses the rural farmers. Uh, his next stop from uh, on his people's tour were the rural communities on the countryside. A good old chunk of the rural farmers of the Rust Belt supported Harrington, so now he has to prove them that he's willing to support his campaign promises. <clears throat> Harrington. Address a group of corn farmers in Iowa to talk about the necessity of investing in the rural industry. He promised that more funding will be invested into subsidizing the farms, uh, improving infrastructure, and creating new schools across the state. Agriculture is one of the main cores of America, so it would be unjust to leave you behind just like that. It was already a recurring show for Harrington tour. A voice could be heard from behind the crowd, I voted for you, now my crops are screwed, you jerk. The Secret Service was ready to push a troublemaker out of the crowd when Harrington ordered them to stop. Do you want to come here to talk about us? Seriously, I'm interested. Harrington exclaimed. The farmer eventually arrived to the podium and the president asked what his problem was. Those rats just screwed my entire harvest and now I don't have a penny. What am I supposed to do? Harrington thought about it for a few seconds and eventually delivered an answer. Those who have the same problems right now, raise your hands. At least a third of the people present raise their hands. Well, I didn't see the rat infestation coming, but that's not an excuse. Not only am I going to invest in better pesticides, but also compensate those farmers that lost their crops. What do you think? Harrington exclaimed, extending his hand. The farmer smiled and shook Harrington's hand with satisfaction. That sounds pretty good. Like a, like a pretty good deal. The event made a really good impression on the rural regions, a guaranteeing a solid support base for future reforms. The president cares about farmers. The hunter's quarry. Oh, heaven for a bread they clawed a bluff. If you want to that, please go ahead. As well as Woodstock as well. Far out. The vote is settled very soon, but I think we're going to end it here. But, did I read this one? Let's read about this one and then wind it. The better angels of our nature. My fellow Americans, I've returned to the capital change, man. I've heard your stories, shared your griefs, broke bread and down beers with you, the working men of this great country. I'm humble, but also hopeful. I know that with you, the people at my back, we can overcome all things. In return for your support, I will fight harder than ever for your cause. Although it might seem idealistic to believe that the halls of power will change for you, I ask you to believe in me, believe with me. 
for there's cause and hope. The eyes of this great country are now turned towards our poorest and are struggling. And the RDs and members of my own party must respond, lest they suffer the righteous wrath of a people scorned in the ballot box. The same applies to the myriad groups of oppressed and discriminated who mingle amongst our nation's poor. I'm confident that the morality of the American people will not fail in loving the least of these. And in the on all these issues, I will fight with you. All, with all the powers available to my office, with my administration will be your champion, and my office will always open to you. As we begin the journey towards a brighter, more moral America, I ask again, are you ready to stand with us? Against the corporations and the judges, against those in our government who would keep you down? Then come fight for your dreams, and together we'll build something greater than anything we could imagine. But if you enjoyed the video, hey, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow when we'll be making a lot of civvies and the eventual response to a potential crisis of oil. Thanks for watching. Have a great, great, great rest of your day.